Welcoming now uh, Dr. Nick Waddy to our telephone microphones, and uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, Wednesday, Dr. Waddy. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Well, Dr. Nick Waddy, on this day in history, there's a lot to choose from. Alfred State uh, History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy, um, wondering. The wise men uh, advise, advising uh, President Johnson to uh, pull out of Vietnam. Let's do that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was uh, uh, shortly after the, uh, the Tet Offensive in 1968, and that was, as many people describe it, sort of the turning point of the Vietnam War. Up to the Tet Offensive, um, most Americans supported the Vietnam War. And President Johnson was firmly convinced that we needed to fight on to victory in Vietnam. And public support began to diminish uh, because of the way that uh, the Tet Offensive unfolded and the way it was reported in this country. And um, at that point, um, a lot of opinion leaders, people like the wise men, started to turn against the war and believe that we needed to find a way out. Um, and that began a process of negotiation that eventually produced uh, the Paris Peace Accords in uh, 1973. So these negotiations did bear fruit, and they did lead to a resolution to the war, um, which, as we've discussed, I think could have could have led to something like an American victory. Um, so I don't think the wise men were necessarily wrong to press for negotiation. Um, but it was the way those those negotiations were handled, and in particular the way the peace was handled after after the settlement in 1973 that uh, unfortunately unfortunately led to our defeat. Another this day in history, uh, MLK, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., led a march of 5,000 anti-war demonstrators in Chicago saying that the Vietnam War was against all America stands for... Uh, the, the History Channel notes that this is something that uh, King began to do in the summer of 1965, speaking against the uh, Vietnam War. Um, it says that uh, King argued that the war diverted money and attention from domestic programs to aid the black poor. And uh, your thoughts on this. Uh, how, much, how much influence do you think MLK's speech would have had his speeches would have had uh, his anti-Vietnam speeches in in the 1960s. There, Doctor Wadi. Well, as as we were just talking about, I think really the Tet Offensive and the beginning of 1968 was the turning point. And before that point, there was opposition to the Vietnam War, but it was definitely not um, convincing or compelling to the majority of the American people. So I think Martin Luther King, if he was opposed to the war in 1965, 66, 67, which apparently he was, then he was going out on a limb and he was advocating a position that, that uh, would have been disagreeable to a lot of Americans. And of course, we know that a lot of the um, insiders who were very um, supportive of the Vietnam War were also suspicious of Martin Luther King and other people who were activists against the war. Um, so I think... I mean, we could say, I think, fairly that uh, opposition to the Vietnam War built slowly in the 1960s. But the truth is that um, uh, until 1968, it didn't reach critical mass. And I think it's also important to understand that even after 1968, uh, American public support for the Vietnam War in some form remained strong. Uh, President Nixon had a policy of Vietnamization. He heavily bombed North Vietnam. Um, so he was both disengaging us from the Vietnam War and in some ways escalating it and also pursuing negotiations. And that sort of mixed strategy had, had pretty broad support. So this idea that after 1968, the American people realized that the Vietnam War was just a big waste of time and we needed to get out ASAP is, is false. The, uh, I'm on the King Institute right now, uh, Martin Luther King, in the... Uh the Martin Luther King Institute at uh, Stanford University. It says, during the last year of his life, King worked with uh, Dr. Spock to develop a Vietnam summer volunteer project to increase grassroots peace activism. In the 1968 election, King linked his anti-war and civil rights work in speeches throughout the country where he described the problems he saw plaguing the nation, racism, 
poverty and the war in Vietnam. Uh, wondering there, uh, Dr. Wadi, um, the uh, assassination of King, would, would that have made, which uh, precipitated the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, King was killed in early April of 68, and then uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy was killed in early June of 68. Wondering, does this, uh, these assassinations, do you think they made the uh, protest movement grow even stronger? Um, well, uh, you know, the, this period of Amer American history is, is, first of all, extremely interesting and, and very volatile. And it, I'm not sure there's been any year in the, in the post-war era more dynamic and, uh, and scary than 1968. And it's not my field of expertise, but... Um, I think the way the media was reporting the war, the way the war was going, these things led to an intensification of the anti-war movement. But I think, to be honest with you, that the, the main effect of those assassinations and of the race riots and, and of all the tumult of 1968, and it was unfolding not just in the United States, but in Europe and throughout the world as well, the main effect of it was to scare um, middle America, the silent majority, and to convince them uh, to to vote for and elect Richard Nixon president in 1968. So um, violence and protest and activism, yeah, they, they can cause progressive change, which of course is, is what uh, progressives are often looking for, but they can also cause a reaction. And I think, I think a lot of those, um, those movements uh, did as much harm to their causes as they did benefit to them. Another This Day in History, March 25th, uh, 1946, Soviets announce withdrawal from Iran. History Channel says, in conclusion to an extremely tense situation in the Cold War, the Soviet Union announced that their troops in Iran would be withdrawn within six weeks. The Iranian crisis, one of the first tests of power between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the post-war world. The Iranian crisis, it says, began in World War II. In 1942, Iran signed an agreement with the British and the Soviets uh, saying that uh, those troops were allowed back into the country in order to uh, defend Iran from the Nazis. And uh, all foreign troops, it said, would, uh, according to a 1942 uh, treaty, would withdraw at the end of World War II. Dr. Wadi, your thoughts on this day in history? Mm -hmm. Well, these events are, are a lot more important than perhaps they sound because I think most people aren't really familiar with what was going on in Iran in World War II or, or right after World War II. But um, the pattern of the Cold War was, was being established, um, a desire on the part of the Soviet Union to expand communist influence throughout the world and a desire on the part of the United States, Britain, and other Western powers to, to limit or block that communist expansion. And Iran was one of the first test cases. And the truth is that, that some of the time, the, the Soviets could be shamed or intimidated into backing down. And they did, um, they did pull out of Iran, they did pull out of Yugoslavia. Uh, so it was possible in a variety of different ways to, to persuade even someone like Stalin. Uh, perhaps the best example is the Berlin blockade. He tried to take control of West Berlin in 1948-49, and we stood up to him. We did the Berlin airlift, and, and he backed down. So even a bully like Stalin could, could get the message, and um, we were constructing a policy in these initial... Uh, in these initial uh, post-war years... Sorry, Brian, I was getting Sounds a call like you're there. cutting you hair to... there, Dr. Wadi. Do you have a barber <laughs> shop we don't that. know about? <laughs> no, that, that would be closed anyway under orders of the governor. Speaking of the governor, I, I do want to get back to this day in history, but uh, as long as you've brought up uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, what do you think the chances are that the Democrats at the convention will uh, uh, decide on uh, drafting Governor Andrew Cuomo to run for president You know, because of the age of Biden and the age of uh, Bernie Sanders? <laughs> Great question. A lot of people are speculating on that. Um, 
So that would rely on uh, Joe Biden, the man, and Joe Biden, the candidate, self-destructing. Uh, he's, he's amassing the delegates to be the nominee. It's pretty clear that Bernie Sanders can't stop him, and Bernie Sanders is the only other candidate in the race at this point. So, um, but I think, you know, Biden suffers from some serious weaknesses as a candidate. And, um, uh, you know, if some underlying health problems emerge or he really embarrasses himself um, uh, by, by um, flubbing some public appearance, it's not inconceivable that uh, his delegates could be used to to nominate someone else as, as the Democrats candidate. And frankly, it's not not even um, uh, necessarily uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing for the Democratic Party. I, I think any Democrat who isn't looking at Joe Biden as their nominee with trepidation is is uh, isn't just not paying attention because he is a very flawed candidate. So I would say the possibility of that happening, I would I would put the number somewhere like five or ten percent. I don't think it's very likely, but but it is possible simply because of Joe Biden's um, eccentricities. Doctor Nick Wadi, our guest today, the Alfred State History Professor. Um, uh, getting back to uh, the history topic, you know, I, I was uh, as uh, you were talking about. Uh, Iran in the 1930s. I uh, did a little research, a quick research, and uh, discovered er, that I uh, was reminded I knew some of this that uh, Iran and Iraq uh, used to be uh, one place, and Persia and Mesopotamia, names like that come up. And the British leaving um, this area became uh, a, a topic that uh, I saw on the History Channel and other websites. And uh, I was wondering, Dr. Wadi, um, how much of an influence was uh, Queen Elizabeth and how much of an influence has Queen Elizabeth been, if any, on the uh, British Empire leaving this, that, and the other country? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Iran is a great test case because um, the British used to be the hegemonic power in the in the Persian Gulf. And they made a decision, I think it was in 1968, kind of a big year, to, to withdraw from pretty much all their security commitments um, east of Suez. And um, uh, I think they, they more or less pulled out of, of Iran in maybe the 1950s. The United States and the Central Intelligence Agency were famously responsible for overthrowing Mossadegh, the, the prime minister of uh, Iran, I think it was in 1951. So basically, around that time, the United States took over the hegemonic role that Britain used to play in the Persian Gulf, and we've had it ever since. To what degree was Queen Elizabeth involved in those decisions? I would say not much. Um, I think she is very invested in the Commonwealth and in trying to maintain the bonds of friendship and to some degree loyalty that exists between former colonies and, and, and Britain. But um, I don't think there's any evidence that she's tried to arrest or, uh, or delay the dissolution of the British Empire. Um, I think these are, this was a process that was set in motion before even she became queen. And um, I think she's, she's accommodated herself to it. So and remember, it was also a process that the United States encouraged. We, want, we didn't trust the old colonial powers. We thought in cases like the Suez Crisis in 1956 that they were, they were crude imperialists and we could do it better. We could exercise Western power more responsibly and more successfully. And uh, I think a lot of the time we were we were a little bit arrogant in that sense, and we would have been better off sharing some of that burden with the British and the French and others, but uh, but we chose not to. Going to take a quick break, check the weather Weather with uh, Rob. We'll be back in just a moment here on the Newsmaker Show with Dr. Wadi. The Ryan Agencies, your local independent insurance agencies. The Ryan Agency employs 15 of your friends and neighbors. They live, shop, and support our community. When you buy insurance from the Ryan Agency, you support local families. Contact the Ryan Agencies today, your local source for all things insurance. Insurance protection you can rely on. 
Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Rob, is the COVID-19 virus affecting the weather world at all? And I'm not talking about the weather so much as uh, the world of meteorology. Yes, it is, Brian, and you're going to really be stunned at the effects that it's having. Uh, every day we have thousands and thousands of flights around the globe on a normal day. When those planes are flying through the atmosphere, they're sampling the air pressure, the temperature at that altitude, the wind speed. All of that data gets ingested by the U.S. model and the European model. And because of COVID-19, the number of flights around the globe has dropped off dramatically. That data is no longer being put into the computer models. So there is a very big concern that some of the longer range guidance, both the U.S. and European models, may not perform as they've been performing in the past when they have all that data. So it's having a direct effect on the output. It's also having a direct effect. I don't know if you've seen some of the TV uh, channels where they've got the uh, meteorologists doing their feeds from their basement, their garages. Uh, it's kind of an interesting world we're living in right now. Interesting, Rob. Hey, how's it looking for us weather-wise? A lot of cloudiness on the satellite photos this morning, Brian. We do have some clearing up towards the Buffalo area. Uh, Niagara is actually in the clear right now. I don't know if it's going to get this far to the south and east. Uh, we've got a storm south of us that's actually producing some light rain this morning around Bradford, PA. I think we're in between, and we end up with lots of clouds. It may brighten up a little bit this afternoon, 50. Partly to mostly cloudy tonight, 35 to 40. Tomorrow, clouds and some sun with the risk of a shower or two, 55 to 60. Scattered showers tomorrow night, lows 35 to 40. Brian, clouds on Friday, chance of morning showers, 45 to 50. Then a larger storm heads our way for the weekend. Sunrise this morning was at 702. The sun sets tonight at 729. And we're back with Alfred State uh, European History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy. Dr. Waddy, on the topic of Europe, what is going on in England? <laughs> well, what's going on is... Um the uh, restrictions on the day-to-day uh, -day activities of the British people are being steadily escalated and they're, they basically instituted a, a nationwide lockdown of the sort that we have in New York State and California and many other parts of the United States. So they initially seemed um, to be taking a somewhat freer and easier approach to the coronavirus pandemic and now they really seem to be cracking down and, and um, and instituting policies similar to what we see in Italy and Spain. Uh, they're obviously afraid that they're at the leading edge of this curve and uh, things are going to get a lot worse. And uh, for whatever reason, it does seem like uh, Europe is the new epicenter of this, this pandemic. And the numbers in terms of, of infections and especially in terms of deaths are much worse in Europe than they are here. And I think uh, the American people need to understand that as, as much as some Americans are panicking about this situation. There are ways in which uh, we have dealt with it better, and uh, we are we are doing better than the Europeans are. The uh, British newspapers had a, a story, and uh, some of the American uh, media picked up on it. Could America overtake Italy in being the epicenter of the coronavirus? Uh, what do you make of that story, Dr. Wadi? What do you think of health care which is more socialized in italy than it is in america what do you make of that and i have other questions to follow up with sure well you know everybody is trying to use this this situation to to vindicate their ideological um persuasion and and uh a lot of that's pretty silly i don't think there's any evidence that socialized medicine or the lack of socialized medicine has much to do with the spread of this virus or or the ability of a, of a country to to deal with it successfully healthcare systems vary in countless ways and um, they have strengths and weaknesses in different countries and um, I don't think anyone fully understands why Italy and, and Spain have been hit so hard, why uh, France and Germany are in a somewhat better position. Um, and, you know, could the U.S. become the next epicenter of, of the virus? Well, the fact is that we're a much bigger country with a much bigger population. So it depends whether you're looking at per capita infections and deaths, in which case we look really good. We look much better than almost any European country. Or you're talking about absolute numbers of infections and deaths, in which case we could easily become the country with uh, the highest numbers at, at a certain point. 
and we got a, quite a ways to go to catch up with, say, Italy in terms of deaths. But given the size of the U.S. population and the number of Americans who may be infected, it is possible. And I think those who say that, that things are going to get worse in the United States before they get better, at least in terms of numbers, are right. Uh, if we are doing a good job of, of limiting future infections, the truth is that lots of people are already infected and many of them are going to get sick and some of them are going to die. And uh, probably that's that's just beginning in this country. Now that, do, that doesn't mean that, I think if you look worldwide, you'll see that um, once you institute these extreme measures, they do have an effect. And, and it's not a question of years. It's not a question of months. It, it, it could be a question of weeks, as President Trump says. So I think we may, uh, have, the worst may be behind us a month from now. But in the meantime, it, it could get pretty ugly. Talking with Alfred State History Professor Dr. Nick Waddy, uh, just about any time before we go, any final thoughts there, Dr. Waddy? No, but I, I really would encourage um, people to, to look at the blog, wadiesright.com, because I post a lot of uh, articles related to the pandemic there, and we have a good conversation going. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of wonderful information sources at this point in time, but uh, I like to think that I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, you're very welcome, Brian.